The title of our event is, and this is a first uh, for us under Carbon Talks, on Carbon Capture and Conversion, Opportunities, Challenges and Potential. Uh, and we'll be wanting to find out more about what exactly is carbon capture and conversion. I'll speak as one of the less technical people in the room. Uh, and what does it offer uh, society? What are the scientific and commercial challenges? And what is current research telling, telling us and what projects have potential, uh, economic and environmental potential, especially projects uh, based here in British Columbia and in Canada more generally? Um, so, uh, our two presenters. The first is Richard Adamson. He's the president of CMC Research Institutes. I think CMC stands for Carbon Management Canada originally. Uh, he's the first president of uh, CMC uh, Research Institutes and has overseen its transition from a research network focused on early stage discoveries to an independent, not-for-profit, helping technology developers and end users identify and move technologies into industry-ready solutions. And he's also assembled a national team that's projecting ways to move Canada to a prosperous, low-carbon future as part of the International Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project. Richard might touch a little bit on that uh, in his uh, part of the presentation. We're, and then second uh, presenter, and they're both going to be speaking to the same set of slides, which is so, so a wonderful degree of integration, which is appropriate. We were talking about the, the lack of coordination that can occur in university settings sometimes. This won't be one of them. I'm delighted to have Noko Ellis from uh, UBC. She's a professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering, and she's the acting senior research director of the Carbon Capture and Conversion Institute, which I'm sure she'll tell us more. Uh, which is a partnership between CMC Research Institutes, UBC, and BC Research Inc. Uh, designed to evaluate and develop technical and economic options for this technology. So with no further ado, we'll start with Richard, please. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'm going to, I'm probably going to get up and walk around a little bit. Oh, thank you. And, uh, and make sure that I, since I can't look over my shoulder constantly, I'll keep this in view. Um, so CMC Research Institutes, uh, as, as Michael alluded to, uh, was really focused on uh, originally academic-led research associated with industrial greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, a few years ago, we uh, had the opportunity to reevaluate our approach, and uh, we basically said our, our objective is uh, reducing industrial greenhouse gas emissions, not publishing papers. Uh, so what we really needed to do is look at how fast we could move technologies off the lab bench and into the world of practice where it will act, uh, have more impact. So we reinvented ourselves as CMC research institutes with the idea of establishing a series of challenge-directed institutes that were still plugged in closely to the academic research world, but were outside of the universities, outside of industry, and outside of the government. Uh, to provide us with the flexibility and versatility to work with all of those parties to move those technologies across the gap. So um, we're a neutral, independent uh, third party. We don't, ha we don't take an interest in the intellectual property. And we're not trying to make money by selling the stuff. What we're trying to do is we're a, we're a mission-driven organization, and uh, our mission is to, uh, it's a fairly simple one, transform the global industrial economy. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so, but uh, the key frame of reference for a lot of our thinking is rapid cost-effective reduction of uncertainty to enable earlier decision-making, which is a really heavily packed sentence. I could spend an hour unpacking for you. But the point really is, the question is, what don't we know about this solution? that needs to be known before somebody's going to buy it, invest in it, or move it forward to the next level. So that's, that's where we focus our, our work. Um, it, as, as I said, we started off focusing on the research side. The institutes focus on adaptation, integration of diverse technologies, um, and application development and scale up. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the context of the institute. The Carbon Capture and Conversion Institute is actually the second of our institutes. The first one was established in Alberta uh, and is linked to the University of Calgary. This one um, is really well uh, situated here in BC, both because UBC has a very strong tradition in development of industrial processes um, and because there's uh, uh, some private 
engineering companies, specifically NORAM Engineering and their subsidiary BC Research here that are very focused on innovation and, and making a contribution to a sort of social development uh, of the area. So they're both, the two groups brought together um, are perfect partners in developing the Capture and Conversion Institute. So the, the key issue here is uh, CO2 capture, many people are familiar with in the context of carbon capture and storage. Um, so essentially what you've got uh, is if you've got a, a substantial in, uh, em, emitter of, CM, uh, of CO2, you want to capture that CO2 and do something with it. Well, one thing you can do is put it back where you got the carbon from originally. You can put it into a geological formation. What if you don't have good geological formations around where you are? Um, what if there's other reasons that you may not be able to do it? In Europe, there's a lot of political pressure against doing carbon storage um, onshore, so they're, they're forced to push things offshore, which makes it very expensive to do. So uh, you want to do something else with the CO2. The carbon conversion component of this is what are we going to convert the CO2 into? Uh, we could convert it into, uh, through mineralization processes, into products like cement and building materials. We can convert it into uh, fuels and that's, uh, that type of thing, um, liquid chemicals, chemical feedstocks, but generally that requires putting energy back in. Uh, to, because essentially when you combust things, what you're trying to do is drive the energy out. Uh, so that's, uh, that's one side of it. Um, so how do we go about doing this? We've got CMC is, is providing a link between the development side of the world and the research side. So uh, Naoko and the team represent the uh, linkage into our global academic uh, research community, but with a very uh, strong linkage into the research teams here on, uh, on at the UBC side of things. We're developing jointly with uh, BC Research uh, a technology commercialization and innovation center. Key issue when you're dealing with many of the academic research projects that we funded um, had things like materials and that sort of thing, but really if you're going to put a solution into the industrial world, you need an industrial process that you can bolt in place and actually scale up and test. The commercialization center allows us to develop and test and scale up pilot projects from kilograms a day up to about a ton or two of CO2 equivalent a day. Uh, so that gets us well up the range towards uh, reducing the uncertainties that are going to get in the way of commercializing the technology. So testing it up in the, the tons per day range. Being able to link uh, academic researchers and, academic, and deep discipline experts from around the world into this process is really crucial. Uh, part of this process, uh, it turns out that when you're dealing with research groups uh, focused on specific uh, technologies, they they tend to love their technology and figure the rest of the stuff required to get there is incidental. That's, that's the easy stuff. This is really what's important. But if you're actually looking at it from an industrial use perspective, you're looking for a total solution, not a single Lego block. Um, and uh, what we find ourselves doing is marrying different types of technologies from different sources to integrate them into a total solution and then test them and move them up that process. So for example, we're working on really interesting precipitating solvents for capture coming out of Sintaf, a, a government lab in Norway, and um, industrial partners out of a small startup company out of the U US who've got a, sp a special kind of a contactor that allows precipitating solvents to work. So they've got the hardware that you can plug into your industrial process they needed uh, a really extraordinary uh, solvent to be able to improve the energy use for their overall process. Sintef had a gr what looks like it might be a very good precipitating solvent. We haven't gotten through the testing programs on it yet. Um, together, they may reduce the cost of capture, the, the capital cost by 50% and the operating cost by 50%. So uh, that's, a, that's a breakthrough. So, this is the kind of things we're doing, bringing these partners together to move them towards solutions, 
um, the next step would then be to start moving it through this process. So taking these early stage bits and pieces, materials and parts, start testing them on the bench scale and moving them up to, to the test and commercialization center. And then um, there's a, a next stage one we're in, we're in talks with the industry on that moves things up to the five tons a day plus level. Uh, so uh, working with uh, BC Research, one of the reasons why we love uh, working with BC Research and NORAM Engineering is NORAM builds full-scale chemical plants and ships them all over the world. They've got a subsidiary that fabricates the equipment. They've got a subsidiary that develops technology working with small startup companies um, and builds pilot plants and that sort of thing. So when you're working with a third party to develop your pilot, you can understand which different development pathways are going to make the capital cost. When you scale it up, what's going to make the fabrication cost go up? What's going to make the operating costs go up? What's going to be a more robust direction to go on your design so that when you are doing a full-scale full plant, it doesn't become a nightmare to, be a, to maintain? So having all of the, that thinking in right at the beginning in the pilot plant is really great. So we're delighted to be working with the NORAM group of companies. We're, the center is the, the Technology Commercialization and in, uh, in Innovation Center is presently under construction on Mitchell Island, right under the Knight Street Bridge. And hopefully uh, July of this year it'll be physically built and by about this time next year um, all of the uh, infrastructure facilities and uh, new bits and pieces of hardware and toys will be in place. And I won't take too much time on it, but you can generally see the location. You're probably familiar with it. And with that, I'll hand it over to Noko, who can talk about the technologies more specifically. Great. Thank you very much. Um, OK, so um, I'd like to cover just a little bit about some of the trending technologies that I've been seeing as the uh, senior uh, research director for the Carbon Capture and Conversion Institute. And I'll uh, divide that up into two sort of areas. One is carbon convert, uh, capture, which we'll start off with, and the second one is the conversion part. So when we talk about carbon capture, we're talking about namely CO2 um, capture. And well, where are some of the sources of CO2? And one of which will be Air. And we've, we know that the increasing amount of CO2 that is in the atmosphere is of the concern. Now, we're talking about, though, it's about 400 ppm or so. And we are still, it is large in a sense in different contexts, but in a sense it is a very small um, concentration in the air. One of the things that is coming up um, that has been, de uh, been developed is through Carbon Engineering, a firm out of Calgary um, led by David Keith, who is uh, building a pilot plant uh, currently in Squamish. And this basically is a concept of capturing CO2 from air, which is the dilute um, CO2 concentration, and basically concentrating and outcomes a very highly concent concentrated CO2, or fairly pure um, CO2 for further conversion. So that concept is being developed uh, currently in Squamish. Another, and so in terms of other sources of CO2, we could see that um, power plants would have stacks and emissions of CO2, which is a little bit higher in concentration than the atmosphere, which is about 10 or 11%. And from that, number of operations, namely using amine solutions, have been used to capture CO2 from um, stacks. What we're um, sort of, what's new in this er arena is to work with um, sorbents. And sorbents by means of different particles that might be able to capture CO2. So one of which is a natural um, sorbent, which is lime, and this is nothing new in that you can capture um, CO2 using calcium oxide, convert it to calcium carbonate, and do that cycle so that you could concentrate, basically concentrate the um, flue gas CO2 emissions from the flue gas into a more concentrated steam, uh, stream. 
So at UBC, we're looking at surface chemistry of this. And as it goes through the carbonation calcination cycle, we're seeing how the morphology of cha is changing and how some of the materials may or may not be suitable. Another one here is a more synthetic route. So this is a beautiful image of what's called the Met Metal Organic Frameworks, MOFs in short. And this is, uh, represents uh, the atoms. Uh, the circle represents the atoms of, in this case, zinc, oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. It's this unique cage-like structure in affinity to CO2 that makes it um, possible to actually embed or capture the CO2 molecules right inside this cage. And so this is a, another new technology that is being developed. And currently, the institute is partially funding Dr. George Shimizu from U of C in this arena. And he is going basically from the molecular level to scaling up so that we might be able to test it at a scale that is going to be meaning, meaningful um, for deployment. Another one uh, that I, so all these technologies basically are looking into concentrating the dilute CO2 um, concentration into a more highly concentrated stream. Another sort of um, technology that I've been working on at UBC is called chemical looping combustion. So if you were to burn, let's say, coal or natural gas in a boiler, what you get will be a CO2 and H2 coming out. The oxygen required for that combustion would normally come from air, which is pretty much 80% uh, nitrogen, which basically gives, gives us it back into that problem of having a dilute CO2 stream and then trying to get that technology so that we can capture and concentrate. In this new format of com uh, combustion, the fuel goes into the fuel reactor, but the oxygen required for the combustion does not come from air, but comes from metal oxide. So this is basically a flameless combustion that you could have, in this case with natural gas, and what happens is metal oxide would release that oxygen to perform that combustion and be placed over to the air reactor to be oxidized again. And so what this scheme does is it inherently separates the flue gas from the air that, is, uh, that could be present in a conventional manner. And so this um, gives us an opportunity to perhaps decarbonize the natural gas combustion system. So this is a, a small pilot scale. It is an um, area of research that I have collaborations with uh, Natural Resources Canada in Ottawa, and we hope that uh, there will be a chance to have a larger pilot scale in operation fairly soon. OK, so we will go down into the ca carbon conversion side of things. And as Richard alluded, um, it is not to do with the sequestration, but in this case, it's basically commoditizing CO2. So what can we do with CO2 in terms of as a chemical compound? Alluded by some of these grand challenges that were coming out, one of which from CCMC and another one from NRG and COSIA, the XPRIZE, both of which are targeting innovation and CO2 utilization. And so I think the new um, sort of upcoming technologies are we're going to be able to see number of different technologies that are going to allow us to utilize CO2. However, the biggest challenge is to do with thermodynamics. And basically what I'm going to try to um, show you here is Gibbs free energy of formation and see what are some of the players um, uh, sort of situate themselves into this um, arena. So here we have, we could have oil or natural gas, and this will, we have been combusting these uh, hydrocarbons to um, generate energy. And the product of that, as we know, are CO2 and H2O. So the location that these um, boxes are, um, are placed are in sort of relation to this Gibbs free energy of formation, which talks more about the energy of the bonds of these molecules. 
So what happens is, as we do in cars, we put gasoline and drive or ignite. So the gasoline will be combusted. CO t from the tailpipe, you'll have CO2 and H2O come out, and you get to go from point A to B using that power generated. But if we were to sort of start thinking about how to utilize CO2 into different chemicals or fuel, we, we could sort of understand that we're going to have to reverse that and put in a lot of energy in order to do that. So one example will be generating hydrogen. We could split water and generate hydrogen, but knowing that hydrogen is much higher in this uh, energy scheme than water, we would require that energy will be inputted in order to do so. Similarly, CO2 can be converted to, let's say, methanol. Methanol sits over here, and so the difference between the CO2 and methanol is going to have to be the energy that we'll need to um, input in order for that to happen. So this is something that nobody can um, work around. We really have to sort of tackle in, um, in getting uh, different uh, chemicals or fuel out of CO2. So knowing that, I would just love to uh, like to showcase some of the things that have been going on in the arena that I have sort of looked at. Um, methanol economy is something that has a number of people have been looking at, including uh, University of Southern California, the Locke Hydrocarbon Institute. Um, they've been looking at catalytic ways or electrochemical ways to convert CO2 into either methanol or dimethyl ether, which is a fuel as well. But as we understand from the previous slide, in order to do that, if we need hydrogen, and in order to convert this, we're going to have to have the energy input. So the sort of the dilemma becomes how much of that is going to be, how much of that is going to be make sense in an overall scheme of things. Right. And it's not as, as clear as it is, as the boundary that you draw is going to uh, sort of change some of the scenarios. But nevertheless, this is one of the um, options that uh, a number of researchers have been looking at. Another one here will be, um, this is an electrochemical processes, and I see um, Mantra, uh, from Mantra Energies. And they're looking into um, converting CO2 into formic acid and formate salts. And that's another sort of commodity that can be traded and or upgraded as a chemical um, building block. One of my other colleagues are working into biological ways in which we can convert CO2. Um, my colleague um, Vikram <coughs> Yadav has been looking at integrating his engineered microbes, so the bioreactor, into a chemical processing plant where he might be able to harvest some of the residual heat from the process at the same time convert CO2. Another one that is going on will be with um, Carbon Cure, which is a Canadian company who takes CO2 and captures it in the form of calcium carbonate and be able to um, inject it into the cement. So he's able to utilize the CO2 and um, reduce the carbon footprint of cement uh, by having this green cement that is now on the market. And a number of buildings have been built as well. Lastly, I'd like to show um, one of the, uh, my colleagues in chemistry department, uh, Parisa Murkadavani, who's uh, working on um, incorporating CO2 and epoxide and using catalyst to make biodegradable plastics. So if you think about CO2 to methanol conversion and using it as a fuel, that's going to generate CO2 again. However, in this scheme, what we're hoping is that CO2 will be captured in as a plastic or a part of the plastic that is going to be um, composted and perhaps embedded. So a number of things are going, and I, I believe that it's a, quite an exciting um, time to be a researcher in this arena. 
Um, so the low carbon future really has started. We do really have to pull ourselves together uh, to make things happen. I believe that technical advances would happen. I'm seeing that uh, there are a number of um, uh, government and policies are shifting and aligning. I hope that institutional commitment is there as well as the so society to be able to sort of embrace the change and really work hard towards a low carbon future. Um, at the Institute, we hope that we could provide that collaborative um, sort of network in order to bring together some hybrid technologies that is going to be utilized as a solution for some of our uh, challenges that we face. And with that, I would like to uh, conclude our talk and thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you very much both to Richard and to Naoko. Um, I neglected to mention that we will have people uh, viewing this online, but we very much welcome uh, comments and questions coming in electronically. Our Twitter hashtag is at Carbon Talks, and uh, my colleague Ian is taking those tweets, and we'll cue him if there's some questions that we want to bring into the room from people who are not here. I'm actually going to start by asking both of you, though, a, a framing question before we go to the audience, because I sense we'll have a lot of good comments and questions from the audience, and that is, uh, Standing sort of over and above any of these technologies, they all involve converting uh, carbon from a variety of sources and maybe leaving aside the ones that are air capture, i.e. CO2 that's already out in the atmosphere. Kind of grosso modo, um, how would these different technologies uh, help address uh, climate mitigation and uh, as, as a goal and low uh, into a lower carbon pathway, um, given the fact that I imagine the source of a lot of the carbon in the first place is uh, combusted uh, hydro hydrocarbons uh, originally used for, for energy purposes. So the carbon is going in different directions into different end products, um, but ultimately over the longer life cycle, um, is this a slowing down of the release of carbon uh, that might be uh, that might occur uh, if compared to, let's say, just burning it uh, for an energy source, or is it uh, locking it uh, away from so that it doesn't ultimately end up in the atmosphere in, in any appreciable time scale. I wanted to get a, just a sense of, you know, where this fits on the realm of climate mitigation approaches, These this broad suite of technologies you're looking at. Um, the short answer is yes, uh, but uh, I can probably give you a little more than that. Yeah. Um, the way we look at, uh, we frame strategically our priorities as CMC is we think about it as basically a century long narrative or more in terms of decarbonizing the global economy. And so in, in the immediate future, what we've got is a lot of legacy investment in industrial processes that have up until now, uh, whether or not they emit CO2 has been not a consideration at all in the design. So there's a lot of huge amount of capital that's been tied up in those processes. So in the next 25 years or so, it's going to be really critical to figure out solutions that will essentially bolt on to those legacy technologies. There's no way practically that we're going to just shut down those industries and replace them with something new when there's trillions of dollars of investment involved. So that in the, the first chapter of this transition is going to be about what can we bolt on to legacy technologies. The next chapter uh, after that will be what are the technologies that can get us the services and products that we want and, and need globally um, without emitting in the first place. So some of, those, uh, some of those may become more tightly integrated. These technologies may be a component of that as opposed to a bolt-on. They may be tightly integrated into it. <laughs> And then there's, there's that, that grand and glorious place that we're all hoping to get to down the road where, they, where intrinsically we've gotten away from processes that emit it all. We've gone to completely green electricity and electrochemistry and photochemistry and biochemistry and we don't have the CO2 emissions involved. Um, during that period of time, at least for the early part of that, we're likely to have to get into negative emissions because we will have overshot the the 450 parts per million, uh, uh, two degrees Celsius. Um, I, I'm extremely skeptical that we will be able to turn this ship, ship fast enough to be able to avoid overshoot. Uh, so 
hence the direct air capture questions and things like that become an important part of that. So, and then ultimately we wind up in this completely sustainable world that we all hope to get to. But as I said, this is a century long process. So that sort of puts it in a context. So it becomes very important up at the front end because we can bolt things on to existing technology. And perhaps other things start displacing it as we get toward the other end of it. So that's part of the, the answer. The other part of it is, um, as, as in are we talking about complete removal of carbon or just the delayed release? Mm -hmm. It depends on the product. Right. Uh, so you know, the, there has to be a life cycle assessment done on every one of these uh, processes right through to the end product and uh, sort of um, uh, uh, right, uh, to find out whether or not we actually have won anything right. uh, in the process. So in short, there's, we're talking about a continuum in, in a sense of ranges of technologies, both in terms of the speed with which they could be introduced quickly, their impact on terms of carbon release, and then a gradual evolution of the technologies moving towards a low carbon outcome. And you can analyze any given technology <coughs> against a couple of those big variables, as well as not least cost and efficiency and, and things that are going to be important to, to industry. Uh, I'll now go to the audience and, um, and looking forward to, if you could please uh, lift your hand and just indicate if uh, who would like to either speak or ask a question. Um, and I'll, so I'm going to indicate the order in which we'll do this. Uh, the gentleman in the blue sweater, I think, first, and then lady in the red, and then third will be in the third row at the back. Okay. Um, question in regards to the big challenge we've got in BC specifically is the really, really low electricity and gas prices, which are making some of these things financially almost impossible here. Um, I've recently just moved over from the UK, and the energy prices here are killing 90% of innovations. That they're just off the start. And it's a big issue because our carbon pricing that the BC is so famous for, of course, ignores all this because it, it focuses only on a specific small number of fuels, uh, including ignoring aviation and shipping. So we're, we're not really looking at industrial processes yet. And it appears that until there's a real price on carbon, that's realistic, that's big enough, uh, the motivation financially to do this is, is, is just not going to be there. And, and do you see any way around this in any other way? Um, patience. Uh, the, this is why I think we're going to overshoot, is because of the issue of, uh, of leakage is the, big, is the buzzword. Uh, if, if any one jurisdiction moves too fast, then they risk driving uh, industry to another jurisdiction. Um, the, the real hope is that there is global commitment to, to moving forward. It doesn't mean that there has to be a global system, but there has to be pretty universal commitment to decarbonizing. So either um, there has to be, um, and I, I take your point about the fuel prices, actually low electricity prices is, in some ways, not a bad thing because a lot of these technology, uh, BC is blessed with hydro, uh, hydropower and, and uh, strength on the renewable side. So a lot of these technologies um, where Naoko look, looking at the Gibbs free energy question, you've got to put energy in to, to do good stuff with the CO2. Um, it requires that that comes from a green source for the whole thing to make any sense. BC is actually in a really good place to be able to do some of that, especially being able to store energy in hydro, uh, hydro dams and that sort of thing. And the low cost on the electricity is good. So it's not all bad news. Um, the low cost of natural gas is, is a problem in terms of reducing uh, usage, and that's, uh, that has to be compensated for with some kind of a policy intervention. Um, and I, we've... I don't want to go down all of the different policy intervention pathways. The, the other thing uh, that I think in the long term is actually going to be a major driver, though, is actually market access. Because there's going to be trade tariffs that are linked to embedded carbon of, uh, associated with products. 
And so if you want access to European markets to sell your products, you're going to have to be able to demonstrate low embedded carbon in your products. I think that's actually going to wind up being more important than uh, tinkering with carbon tax. Um, can I ask how you are funded? <laughs> um, I, I neglected to put my tin cup out. In, 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 in any way we can is, is the answer to that. We started off with uh, a, a $25 million grant from the federal government uh, that was directed towards the academic-led research project. Um, uh, and we have long since spent all of that. We, uh, we also received $25 million from the government of Alberta which was much more flexible and has allowed us this trans has helped helped us in this transition period and about two and a half million from industry um, we are working toward a model that will be a mix of government grants and uh, fee for services type uh, type funding um, I would say right now our burn rate exceeds our revenue <laughs> burn rate of dollars of dollars <laughs> I also, I, I, so you I, actually have some revenue. Uh, we do. You do charge for some. Oh, yes, we we char we work with uh, with uh, in industry partners on trying to move projects forward or assessing, evaluating uh, technology pathways that might be applicable uh, to their industrial process, that type of thing. Um, our other institute, the Containment and Monitoring Institute. Uh, does uh, that's more uh, geosciences and, and monitoring and measurement technologies. They work with uh, companies out of France and, and elsewhere. I would say uh, and the U.S. Department of Energy through Lawrence Berkeley Labs uh, funds research at the new facility over uh, that type of thing. The amount of, of sort of ongoing operational revenue from Canadian sources um, is limited. Now, just to build on that, now go, will your uh, <clears throat> institute uh, get some funding from private from the private sector uh, in order to, there is some co-investment but from the private sector in your research institute and um, and uh, are there some prospects even now that you can see for commercials, I mean uh, more than just hypothetical commercial spin-offs from the work that you'll be doing? It, it can, it can happen and um, our model is, is if any, any funds are privately, private funds or industry funds uh, do come in, that it would be leveraged uh, with government uh, funds and whatnot so that it would go further um, into supporting and moving the technology development forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Okay. Uh, and I neglected to ask if people can just uh, identify yourself and if you wish to give an institutional affiliation, uh, please do so, so sir. Hello, <clears throat> my name is David Gregg, and um, my question is very general in the sense that um, I'd like to understand the bigger picture here. Okay, so these are quite sophisticated solutions, and we know that sophisticated solutions um, are somewhat obtuse in trying to understand and communicate to the general public of what is the most cost-effective um, and time-effective so, as an example, um, uh, recently certain car manufacturers have been messing around with the catalytic converters inside the cars and uh, have not been telling the truth. So, the difficulty with producing uh, carbon capture equipment is we need to understand, we, the general public, need to understand what is really cost effective and what is timely. So. Can we get this big ship turned around before we screw up the atmosphere? I don't know. So it occurred to me that one of the things that we lack, the general public, is an understanding of the technology. But perhaps what we really need is a baseline. So here's a suggested baseline, not necessarily um, truly um, pragmatic. But let's say, for instance, we decided to green the middle third of the planet. Let's say we use all of that free energy from the sun to produce uh, photo, photovoltaic electricity for irrigation and green the planet. We could capture through the trees, we could capture the carbon dioxide. That could be 
a baseline by which you compare all of these other very sophisticated methods of capturing, car capturing carbon. Do any of the two panelists know of any baseline in that's done that's simple, understandable, doable now, and able to complete the end goal of turning the ship around? The, the question sort of assumes that there is a, um, a, a single kind of A, B, C kind of conversation going on, and that's in fact really not the case. The case is that we will need to use absolutely every tool at our disposal uh, to deal with this problem. So it's not a question of renewables versus um, some of these other technologies or should we do this or should we do that. We should do it all. Um, and, and as soon as we possibly can. There, there will be some choices made essentially in the market as to which become, which are the most promising on an economic basis. Um, but if the, if the policy tools are there and the forces are there to drive towards real commitment and action, then investments will be made to, to find the best solutions for it. Um, our perspective is not to say this is a better solution than that. Our perspective is to say let's get the tools on the table that will enable the critical decision makers to make the decisions they need to make. So we're not, we're not trying to promote one pathway over another. What we want to do is, as CMC overall, is to set up a series of institutes that are addressing the biggest challenges, that uh, the ones that we think we can actually move um, and get the, get the uh, options on the table for the decision makers. So, um, the, the closest thing to the answer to the question you were talking about in terms of baselining is simply charts that are showing dollars per ton of CO2 comparing different technologies. Including natural. Uh, including, including natural approaches and wind, uh, wind and solar, and et cetera, et cetera. The only problem is um, there is no chart you can build with enough dimensions to take into account all of the unintended consequences of massive rollout of any one over another. So. Hi, um, uh, Laurie Rimai, um, Resourceful Paths Consulting, my new firm. A um, um, question about um, some of the big um, uh, publicly funded uh, carbon capture projects, like I understand, like Quest in Alberta, what the government's put down, nearly $900 million for about a million tonnes of CO2 a year, I understand. Um, so, you know, there is money going into these projects, these specific projects. Um, and I guess there's a portfolio of, of these type of things going on. Just any views on um, whether that's a good thing, whether those investments into single projects um, are going to lead to um, you know, perhaps uh, spin-offs, uh, perhaps a source of CO2 to develop uh, a methanol economy in Alberta, that kind of thing, or is it simply an investment that allows, uh, in that case, Shell, I guess, to continue to operate a fossil fuel um, facility for uh, an extended period of time um, without any beneficial reuse. Any, any thoughts on, on that? Uh, this one looks like me again. Um, uh, yeah, actually, uh, it's really important to build these first-of-a-kind plants. And first-of-a-kind plants are always overbuilt. They're always over-engineered. They always put on, you know, belt and suspenders av on every decision. So they wind up being massively expensive. Um, because nobody can afford to let the first one fail. They'll never get a second chance. So uh, the projects like ShellQuest are massively expensive, but what is learned, it isn't how many dollars per ton on that project that matters. What matters is what's learned there in order to drive the cost out of future installations. Um, there's a lot of flack that's been given to the fact that the Boundary Dam capture plant in Saskatchewan was only operating at something like 40% capture and was aiming for 90% capture. Well, the issues in the first few months of operation were engineering issues, not fundamental to the technology. And they're doing things like replacing liners in tanks. And 
just stuff that you learn when you build the first of a kind plant, and it will do 90% when it's done. And the next plant will, uh, uh, Mike Mania, the president of their CCS side, uh, is claiming 20 or 30% reduction in cost for the next plant they build. So it's important to do, the first ones have to be built. Um, Canada has punched way above our weight in terms of contributing to that side. It's also bought us a place at the table on the international conversation around those kinds of solutions. So it's bought us some credibility. Um, it, um, I, I show up at a lot of those kind of meetings around the world and Canada is listened to at those meetings and that's part of you know, sort of the hidden value in, in those investments. Um, I believe that those kinds of investments will lead to an ability for Alberta to have some really good commercial carbon storage projects at under $50 a ton, which is fully compatible, if not better than uh, wind energy and, and solar other, and other paths. The thing, the thing to remember when you look at Shell Quest, people look at Shell Quest and they say, well, yeah, but it's no big deal. Look at there's just this pipe going into the ground and it's, the pipe's only about this big and it's, you know, there's a little fence around it. To replace that project would be something like 100 square miles of wind turbines. Um, it's, people don't understand that the scale of the amount of impact of one of those major industrial projects is, is absolutely huge when compared against some of the other, uh, other approaches. So it's, it's important to think in terms of tons of CO2, dollars per ton, not, oh my God, we just spent 90, nine, uh, $900 million. And I think the questioner, if I understood the direction your question was wondering is, does that uh, stored CO2, is that a potential use for future conversion projects um, of the kind that you were talking to a bit earlier, or is that not really currently in the business plan for, for those couple of projects that already exist? Um, it's not currently in, well, those two projects, the Boundary Dam and Shell, are quite different. Boundary Dam, they're using the CO2 primarily for enhanced oil recovery. Right. Yeah. Um, CO, uh, uh, Quest, they're doing deep storage. Yeah. Um, it would be possible to extract the CO2 from Quest in the future uh, for other uses if, if such a use were to arise, but it's not in the business plan. Okay. Sure. Uh, Olga Schwarzkopf, a citizen of British Columbia, I guess. <laughs> um, my question has to do with uh, the issue you brought up about legacy uh, the legacy category that we have, and I'm assuming that stack capture would uh, be compatible with dealing, having that interim capture of CO2. Uh, now, currently, we have stack designed to collect other emissions. Uh, what about the compatibility in attempting to capture CO2 in a stack with those other emitters emissions that we're capturing already? Or are we going to be asking industry to put up a separate ta uh, stack, which I'm not sure how you would do that, <laughs> to just capture CO2 because of the materials required to capture that? And I had a second question is, uh, do we, are we working with international partners on these issues, or are we sitting out there <coughs> competing with each other? Yeah. Well, uh, CMC is very heavily involved in international uh, collaborations. We work with groups out of Australia, the UK, no Norway, Germany, uh, Switzerland, uh, Korea, Japan. Uh, we've got partners around the world, and we, uh, and the US, of course, extensively. So we've got a lot of partners, and we bring, uh, and in the example I used, it was, it was actually a Norwegian uh, uh, sorbent or, or solvent and a U.S. contactor that we're bringing together to develop further here for, in Canada. So yes, international collaboration is central to what we're doing. Um, and the first question uh, on the stack, on the compatibility, the um, essentially what you wind up doing is replacing the, the cleanup systems that you've got on the stack uh, because uh, the CO2 capture, the 
current generation of CO2 capture. I have to be careful because we're, the, ball, the goal points, posts are constantly moving, but the current generation of capture technologies um, would be damaged if you didn't clean up the stack gases really thoroughly before the CO2 capture component. So what, um, what implicitly happens, and people don't often talk about this, is when you put a CO2 capture system on, you actually really raise the bar in terms of the level of cleanup on everything else um, in the process. Well, there's a, there's a couple of incentives. Um, first off, uh, government telling them that they're either do this or shut down, um, which which works fairly well. Um, it, it, the other is is on a dollars per ton basis, and um, you know in Saskatchewan, because they have vertical integration, basically the power company is the government, um, and the government looks at the value not just of cents per megawatt or, or per uh, kilowatt hour, they're also looking at tax base and jobs and, and the larger impacts on the province. So they, they use a slightly different perspective when they make the decision. The government there is, is very committed to moving that, uh, that forward. Elsewhere where there's more of a deregulated environment, that's harder to make that, those choices. So mm, those guys may just go out of business instead. Sorry, sure. Two questions. Uh, Sandeep Woods, Varshney Capital. We're a clean tech VC. Uh, first question, um, is there a technology today that um, you could put money into and have a positive NPV? And if not, when? When will the price of carbon uh, elevate to $30, $40, $50, or you know, up to the $40, $50 a ton range? No, right now, oh, well, right now, The probably the only one that's really on the market right now is Carbon Cure and their uh, precast concrete with CO2 absorption. They've got 16, uh, last, last I heard, uh, they announced the 16th licensee uh, down in the States uh, for their technology. So there's, there's a number of people who have licensed, groups who have licensed that technology and are producing green precast concrete components. And uh, my understanding is they um, are about to release their technology as a, as a cast-in-place solution as well, so, uh, which will significantly increase their uh, potential market. Okay. And, and the second question, um, we emit 30 billion tons a year. What order of magnitude are we talking about if all of these technologies were to be deployed with a billion dollars? Like, does it even make a difference? By we, you mean? The, the industry. The, globally? Yeah. Um, as I say, we have to look at all of the solutions. So the, one of the key questions on all of these uh, uh, conversion technologies is the trade-off between what's the economic value of the product you're producing and what's the total market size. Um, as uh, one, one company proposed that they could make omega-3 fatty acids out of CO2 at $20,000 a ton. How many tons of omega-3 fatty acids do we have to produce before we've saturated the market? Um, so we have to look at uh, you know the practicality of the trade-offs and the versatility of the number of products that the different technologies can produce. So again, we're not talking about silver bullet solutions. This is the one that's going to do it all. What we're looking at is we've got the electricity sector. There's a heavy move towards renewables. Storage is an issue um, to deal with that. That's a whole, that's a whole field of, of area. But there's a bunch of industrial processes that specifically have emissions that are hard to get rid of uh, other, by other means. And these, are, these technologies are more uh, aimed not, we're not trying to deal with automotive emissions. We're not trying to deal with your home furnace. We're not trying to deal with 
the power plant, uh, you know, the, the power sector as much. We're really focusing on an area that's a tough nut to crack uh, if, if we're going to continue with uh, the industrial products that we use. So we're narrowing down, and absolutely, you raise a perfectly good point, and it's a point that we ask about all of the technologies we look at. Okay, but if you spent a billion dollars, could you capture a billion tons, which would be 3% of our emissions? Probably not. A dollar a ton is a really tall order. <laughs> That's what I thought. I just yeah. wanted to hear from yeah. the experts. Yeah. Uh, there's a question on the Twitter feed. Does your research have a position on current geoengineering actions and your proposed types of carbon capture innovations and methods? First, the first bit I'm going to say is we are not an advocacy organization, so we wouldn't have a position specifically um, on, on that. Um, so, no. Geoengineering is a funny term that covers a, a, a world of different types of technology. So I'm, um, if you're talking about um, albedo modification type technologies. That's not an area we've been doing research on. Uh, I've, I've had lots of conversations with David Keith around that area and he's written a great book and if you want to learn more about that area and understand the pros and cons, I think I highly recommend David Keith's book on the topic. But uh, I, uh, that side of it, no. Broadly speaking, um, CO2 capture is also thrown under the basket of geoengineering, especially direct air capture, and I, I have a hard time adding, uh, treating that in the same sentence as albedo modification by, by sprinkling pixie dust in the atmosphere. I think I'll, I'll just add to, to that in terms of um, uh, one of my colleagues at UBC, Greg Dippel, has been uh, working on accelerating uh, CO2 mineralization um, in tailings ponds. So that's something that's probably a newer area that's uh, emerging in, within this realm. Yeah. I'll ask uh, just one final question, if I may, and then I think we're at, at the going be at 3.30. Um, but invite people to come up and speak to the panelists if you've got other things that you'd like to ask them about directly. And that is, just picking up on the last couple of questions on, on, on price. Um, and I'll uh, direct this maybe at Naoko in the first instance, but Richard, you might want to comment as well. Are any of the technologies that you're, you're currently looking at, um, uh, do they all, uh, is carbon as it's pre at its present cost, let's say at least in the BC context with the existing carbon tax, um, uh, is the price of carbon as a feedstock so low or so cheap that the costs of the engineering, the, uh, the energy conversion and other aspects involved make it uh, that there's no product that they would produce that is um, uh, commercially viable at the present cost of carbon itself? Um, perhaps I haven't worded it correctly, but I just wanted to get more of a sense as to how much is going to, <coughs> to what degree will either the um, a, a market intervention, be it regulation or taxation or other forms of changing the international price on the price on carbon, going to be necessary to make um, technologies beyond the uh, the cement technology that Richard already referred to commercially viable, and maybe if you give us a sense of which ones are maybe coming in a little lower threshold of commercial viability. Tough final question. Um, I think that um, it, it truly depends, once again, on the market and what the product is. And if we're going to be um, putting in energy to produce a, something that's going to be burnt quickly and that's going to be have to be competing with other fuel, that probably would not make sense for a very long time to come. Um, but um, I guess it really depends on the market uh, share that we may be able to create by having peripheral other benefits that come along with life cycle assessment and whatnot. And by other benefits, what would you 
Um, so such as um, having a um, lower carbon footprint for the whole process as opposed to just the product alone. And we also, when we're looking at performance validation, we're looking at things like water use and, and other impacts as well. If we focus on only one variable, we're likely to wind up with a lot of nasty unintended consequences, so we, we try and look largely at it. The, um, the way to put, I think, the best way to put the perspective on it is the current generation of technologies for CO2 capture, that, which is really essentially 1950s technology with some tweaks and adjustments and, and incremental improvements. Um, if you're doing talking about a, a coal-fired power plant, you're in the $100 a ton range, give or take, and uh, given the Canadian dollar right now, probably $130 a ton. Um, the, within the next decade, we should be in the, and I'll use U.S. dollars because it's, it's, it's easier. Um, uh, we should be in the $40 a ton capture only, not conversion. And within a decade after that, 25 or less on the capture side. So the cost of these technologies is going down rapidly. I'm going to de deviate into the deep decarbonization pathways project uh, uh, slightly because it puts things in, in perspective. In the DDPP pro project, which was a, tech a techno-economic modeling exercise that Canada and 15 other countries did, we, we led the Canadian team on it, looking at, assume we get to 2050 and we're on track for two degrees Celsius, um, and we've tripled the global economy. Each country was challenged to say, what does your economy look like? And then backcast, how do we get there and what policy tools might we have used to get there? Um, that report was synthesized and submitted to the COP21 by Francois Hollande. Uh, it's a fascinating report. It's available on our website. I rec recommend you read the Canadian one. One of the things that uh, really came up, though, was the policy tools were divided into a direct regulation, there are certain things that are just handled by direct regulation, um, construction standards, uh, motor vehicle, cafe standards, those kinds of things. Um, there are certain things where um, it's more like a, a large industrial projects, there's, there's types, of, types of tools that suit that, and then a general broad tax for, uh, for the remainder. What it boiled down to was if you just tried to treat the whole thing as a dollars per ton basis and get rid of the noise, it boiled down to by 2050, the economic models indicate in order to get there, we have to be looking at 700 to 750 dollars a ton. Um, the thing that's the thing that's really interesting, though, about that number was when cap and trade was in, in, put in place for sulfur emissions in the U.S. on coal-fired power plants, the economists projected that the price that they would have to get to in order to be able to achieve their emission reduction targets was $700 a ton, and it never exceeded 200 Because economists are really lousy at modeling innovation. They, you know, you, transformation, transformative technologies are really hard to predict. So it, I don't know that it's necessarily a direct comparison. But I would, I would tend to, on the one hand, let's get serious. This is not a small problem. It's going to require serious investment. It's b going to be significant dollars. On the other hand, I wouldn't necessarily take that $700 a ton as gospel. Um, we're working as hard as we can to find ways of breaking that coupling that the current economic models are, are starting to highlight for us. All right, well, on that very uh, uh, thought-provoking final comment, I'd like to thank both our speakers for coming and sharing with us. This has truly been a carbon talk, so it's delightful to have you both here. Uh, and thank you very much for getting it uh, started for 2016 with this program of talks. We'll be doing another one next month and we'll give you the date in uh, a forthcoming email. Thanks so much for coming.